to Spooky Stitches, a knitting podcast that is 50% wool and 50% spooky stories. My name is Sheena Piero. I'm the author of 10 books that range from slightly spooky and mysterious to creepy AF. And below you will find timestamps for all the sections in this podcast, as well as links to everything that I talk about. If you enjoy what you see here today, please like, comment, subscribe, and or share whatever floats your boat. And today our background noise is brought to you by my cat Wid, who is right here <laughs> next to the camera, and two other felines that have just entered the room. So we'll see if I can do this uninterrupted. It's not looking promising. So the last two weeks have continued to be a roller coaster. Um, I am currently very frustrated with my temp agency because they told me that the job I would be getting was going to be a full-time hybrid position. It's a part-time all-on-site position. So we're having some communication problems, mostly on their side. Um, but I do really like the new job, and the nice thing about it is that I get Fridays off, which has been really great for being able to write and relax, and I'm a very big fan of the four-day work week, or it's have been. I had a job ages and ages ago before I got sick, where I worked like nine or ten hours four days a week, and then had a three-day weekend. That was great. I loved it. Um, I love that job. They did not love me. So, um, upcoming releases. We are going to have a new short story going up on the Patreon soon called The Book of Doors. Uh, there's also the author workbook, the new author workbook, which I just put up this morning for free on Patreon. It will be going up March 1st in my Gumroad shop, and it will be pay what you can for the introductory period. Um, currently I have it set at $1.99, which is the lowest that Gumroad will allow me to put it at, just because I have some other like discounts and promos going and it won't let me go below that. Uh, also, I am currently working on a NaNoWriMo workbook. So, the author workbook is the first in a series called the uh, Author Roadmap. Um, we're doing one for just like a general writing, one for NaNoWriMo, and then there's going to be a third volume that is about publishing. So uh, I'm figuring that the NaNoWriMo workbook, this is the middle to end of February, I'm thinking it'll probably be out in April or May. That is my current expectation. Um, I'm also updating my Patreon at the moment. I'm adding a couple new rewards to existing tiers. And I'm also going to be adding a new top level tier, which will be the ability to get writing mentorship from me. Um, this is not a cheap tier because it does take a lot of time and effort on my part. Um, but it will include things like video calls, um, a set number of pages that can be critiqued monthly, um, advice on uh, publishing, finding an agent, self-publishing, whatever route you decide to go. So that is going to be coming soon to Patreon. I just have not worked it in yet. I'm still working on some of the logistics for it. Um, but that will be coming up soon. It should be up and ready to go by March. Now, looking at the knitting side of things, I only have one FO this week, and it is something that does not look like me at all. <sighs> yeah, no, no. This is a donation hat. <laughs> I'm trying to work through some of the odd balls of yarn that I have in my stash. And this I got when we first moved to Seattle. It is just 100% acrylic yarn that I got from Target. It was in the dollar spot for Halloween. They had these like hat making kits. 
and my only excuse is that we had just moved to Seattle and my stash was still in storage. So I was desperate for yarn. So I got this and then looked at it and then immediately placed it in the picks order. So I used this up. I'm not impressed at all with the yarn. Like the yarn itself is fine. It's a basic acrylic. Um, it is pretty soft, but it's also quite splitty. And uh, the way that they had bound up the ball, it had a little pom-pom on top. And I don't know what it's called. If you've worked in fashion retail, you know what this thing is. It's a kachunker gun is what I call it. And it's used for attaching price tags. And they used that thing to attach the pom-pom to the rest of it, except they used a string instead of a plastic cord. So the string got like spun into the yarn and I couldn't get it out, so I have a huge ball like this big that I just had to throw out because I would have had to cut it every six inches to untangle it and get that string out. So, not impressed, Target. This is definitely going in donation. It is not my colors. I picked it up mostly because of the aqua and purple. But yeah, there's just way too much green and orange in that, and that is, those are not my colors at all. So that's my only finished object. I was hoping to have two this week. It didn't happen because I had a bout of cast on itis. So I cast on this hat, which I'm not sure what the yarn is. I ended up losing the ball band. I can tell you that it is 50% cotton and 50% bamboo. And it still has that same kind of limey green in it, but I love the blue and the purple. I think that these colors work really well together. As you can see, they kind of go pretty well with my mermaidy decor. So this is about halfway done. And this is just my basic hot recipe. The only difference is that instead of a knit one, purl one rib, I did knit two, purl two, and then I added some cables. Just because this is cotton and bamboo, it doesn't have the elasticity that a wool yarn would, so the cables helped keep it nice and snug around the forehead. I'm using two and a half US needles, which I think is a three millimeter if I remember correctly. And this is my second set of needles. My first set was a bit shorter. You can see how long these are. I had to switch because someone, black and fluffy, who is currently giving me side eye, chewed on my cable while I was at work and chewed it up so badly that I had to get wire cutters and cut the needle out of my yarn. It wouldn't move in any direction. It basically had little barbs running all the way down the cable. It was in danger of tearing the yarn. It was really bad. <laughs> so this is now under lock and key when I'm not working on it. And we keep the void away from my needles. And she's now trying to sneak up to me. Are you apologizing? Hmm? She's like, no, I'm just going to stare at you awkwardly while you talk to a camera. Cats, man. Uh, my other whip. Uh, this is the sock for my editor. It's Hermione's Everyday Sock in Knit Picks Stroll. The color is cordial. I think this is a hand paint. That's yeah, not tonal. It's nitpicks hand paint. Um, I absolutely love it. I'm working on the heel gusset right now. It's just been living in my bag at work and I usually work on it at lunch. Um, although I probably won't have much time to work on it next week because we're going to be slammed. Okay. And then... I've been working on the sweater. 
can see that's where I was last time. This is the French vanilla sweater, which is my own design. Um, I did confirm that the blue and gold or bronzy color, brassy, uh, this is astrolabe. I still have no idea what the two solid colors I'm mixing it with are. Um, here's where we are so far. Um, yeah, I'll probably start the bottom rubbing as soon as I run out of this ball right here. This is the plain blue. So I'm working on that, but I'm kind of frustrated with it because the yarn does make my hands itch working with it. So I know I have to wear something underneath it, but the more I look at it, the more I'm just like, but will I actually wear this? Like, I know the design is good and the purpose of making this was to work out the design, but also to use up that astrolabe yarn. So I really don't want to rip it out again. I think I might just finish it and then set it aside as a sample, but it's also not a good sample because I don't know what two of the yarns are and the other one is discontinued. So I know I have to knit it again in the future. I just don't know what to do with it. I'm just really frustrated and kind of over that sweater right now. I just want to get it done and off the needles so I don't have to worry about it anymore. And then lastly, we have the Eleonora stockings. This is Knit Picks Luminance Lace in the color Passion. I have finished the cuff. You can just barely see it. I'm starting on the leg right here. I had to rip that part out so many times because I could not get the decreases right. Math is not my strong point. So trying to figure out even decreases was really hard. I finally settled on decreasing every five stitches, every five stitches, every six stitches. And then I still had two stitches left over at the end. I just knit two together twice. We're going to call it good. That's as close as I can get. And I don't think that this number of stitches actually can be divided evenly. Um, but that's, that's what we've got. That's what we're working with. So I have started the leg. It should start to move a little bit more quickly now. Um, I just need to mark out where the decreases are on the leg. Um, I was concentrating on the cuff first. Now I can start working on my notations for the calf and the leg. And then that's going to take me a little while. So if you want more updates on this project, uh, you can check out eleonoraproject.wordpress.com, which will be linked below. And these socks have their whole own website because they're part of a larger project. Okay, so that is it for the knitting content this time. Um, I'm going to skip our sponsorship moment because I feel like I talked enough about Gumroad and Patreon at the top of the episode. So we're just going to skip straight to our shout out, which is to Wooly News, which is produced by Isabel Duchatel. I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong. French is my second language and I'm not fluent. Um, she is a French knitter and she has several different series up on her channel where she talks about knitting and um, different things from the yarny world. She has one series called Wooly News where she goes over new pattern releases, yarn sales, things like that. And that was the closest thing that I could find to uh, yarn news when I was looking to produce knit tea. So go check her out if you are into more of like new pattern release news. Um, I'm trying to cover more like events and um, less about things like sales and designer releases just because a lot of those things like the sales tend to be very localized and things like 
designer releases, there's a new designer release every single day, like at least one. So I'm not focusing on that. I'm focusing more on like actual news and events and goings on. So this week we have a double segment. Um, for watching and reading, I just finished up two different books. One of them is called Other Powers by Barbara Goldsmith, and it is a biography of Victoria Woodhull, the first woman to run for president. But it's also a lot more than that. There's a lot of background, con contextual, historical, cultural information. Um, it's basically a who's who of New York in the 1860s and 70s. And my big complaint with this book, it's 450 pages. It's huge. And a lot of the stories don't seem connected until you get to the last chapter. So I'm, I was reading it for Victoria Woodhull and it spends a lot of time talking about people who hated her and people like Henry Ward Beecher, who unfortunately I'm related to, he's a bit of an asshole. And he was involved in this huge scandal and was blaming her for everything when really he was a douche. So you don't really see how these things connect until you get to the end of the book, which is a great writing technique, don't get me wrong, but I went into it looking for Victoria and she was like a third of the book. So not my favorite. It was really interesting and enjoyable. It just wasn't what I was looking for and that's why it took me so long to finish it because I've literally been trying to finish this book since October and have not been able, I had so much trouble getting into it because it went so far off topic at the beginning. And like looking back, it all tied in at the end, but it was really hard to see that when I was reading it. The other book that I finished is called Six Women of Salem by Marilyn K. Roach. And this is following six individuals from the Salem Witch Trials, both accusers and accused. And again, this was really interesting, but I had trouble following it because everybody had the same name. They were all like Elizabeth and Mary or Sarah. And it just became so hard to keep everybody straight and half of them are related, but you don't necessarily know, is this Anne related to this one or is she related to this one or is it a different Anne? It was very confusing and I was listening to it mostly at night while I was trying to sleep, which did not help, but it still had a lot of information that I was not familiar with. And I think that she did a really good job writing, um, dramatizations of some of the events. So that one I do recommend. Just you may want to take notes when you're reading it because it can be very confusing. Um, or maybe that's just me. I have some audio processing issues so I don't learn as well when I'm listening. Um, that's one of the reasons why I picked up audiobooks and podcasts was to try and not correct it exactly but to like practice that skill because I know that it takes more effort for me. Um, in this case, it was just, nope, can't follow it. Uh, now my current read is another audiobook and it's called Killers of the Flower Moon by David Gran. And it's about the Osage murders in <laughs> I'm a little unclear on the year. It's like the late 19 teens, early 1920s. It's like right around the start of prohibition. And there were these horrible murders going on in the Osage tribe in Oklahoma, I think is where it was. Um, and it, how that ties into the start of the FBI. There was rampant corruption. They really needed outsiders to come in and handle this. And people just kept dying. Like it was some sort of organized murders. I'm only about halfway through it, so I don't know the whole story yet. Um, but it is really interesting. And then the thing that I just started watching 
is I watched the first season of the Medici series on Netflix a few years ago. Did not realize that there were going to be more seasons, so I just found season two, Il Magnifico, a couple nights ago, and I've been watching it, and it's really good. It's not necessarily historically accurate, but it does tell a good story. And once again, it points out that the most successful Medici weren't the ones who were uh, really militaristic or ruling with an iron fist. It was the ones who cared about the people around them and were trying to make things better for the city. And that really confused a lot of people because Machiavellian politics originated in Italy in Florence. So it's been really good. The biggest thing I'm faulting this series for right now is something that Carolina Zabrowski pointed out in a short little video that she did where apparently modern audiences can't recognize women unless their hair is down and their boobs are out. So even though all of these women would have been dressed much more modestly with higher cut garments and they would have had their hair up and covered because that's how you kept it clean. There was dirt and smoke everywhere. They're walking around with like hair down to their waist. It's all flowing locks and they have to look extremely feminine and sexy all the time. And just like, no, that, that, that's not Renaissance Florence at all. <laughs> but it is a really good story. Um, you know, Lorenzo the Magnificent is not the focus of my study. I do think that the third season kind of transitions over to Cosimo, but um, I could be wrong about that because I'm not even halfway through season two right now. So I'm going to keep watching with that. Um, I am going to put a review of the whole series once I'm done up on the Eleonora Project blog just because it is kind of related. Um, but that's pretty much what I've been watching and reading lately. Anyway, I think that it is time we transition to a voiceover Sheena for our story this week. Um, this time around, we are going to get the first chapter or so from my novel By the Grace which is set during the 1918 flu pandemic. It was not my intention to release a pandemic book in the beginning of a pandemic. I had picked the date like six months in advance, but it coincided with the first lockdown and that was not intentional. But still, you know, if you like ghosts and murder mysteries, stay tuned because it is a really good story. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of not really a caveat, but some background information here. Um, Julia Grace, the main character, is autistic. She is frequently referred to as feeble-minded in the book because autism was not a diagnosis in 1918. What it was, it was considered a symptom and it was a symptom of schizophrenia. It was not its own diagnosis and the definition of autism at that time is not the definition of autism that we have today. In fact, they were opposites. So be aware of that language if you choose to pick up this book. Um, it is historically accurate and I've tried to be as sensitive to it as possible, but the characters in this book don't have the vocabulary that we do today. So. I'm trying to be both historically accurate and respectful, which is a very delicate tightrope to walk. And that's something that has come up a lot in my historical novels, just because every single one of them deals with some kind of mental health disorder, disability, queerness, and these people just don't have the language for a lot of it. So 
anyway, let's go back to 1918 and join Julia Grace as she hunts for a murderer in a boarding school. By the Grace by Sheena Peril. Chapter 1 From the Chillicothe Inquirer. Chillicothe under quarantine. Friday, October 18th, 1918. As the influenza outbreak rages in nearby Camp Sherman, officials have placed the city of Chillicothe under quarantine. Soldiers are banned from entering the city proper and attending public entertainments in theaters and dance halls. All residents must wear a mask when in public. These can be procured from any Red Cross location throughout the city. Citizens are encouraged not to enter public spaces unless necessary, not to loiter when away from home, and to return home before dark. Saturday, October 19th, 1918. We found the body at dawn. Well, Enid found it. Her. She went to ring the morning bell to wake us and found Ada face down in the fountain. Instead of the bell ringing at 7 o'clock, I woke to screaming. The teachers pulled Ada out of the water, but it was very clear she was dead. The infirmary was just above the back door. I sprang out of bed like a shot at the sound of the screams. Once I realized we weren't being invaded, why would the Kaiser bother to invade a girls' school in Ohio, and the building wasn't on fire, I looked out the window, saw Ada's fiery red hair spread out in the water, half frozen. I was one of the first ones down, wrapped in my quilt, barefoot and in my nightdress. Frost covered the flagstone patio, so cold it burned under my feet. Ada wore her civvies instead of her uniform. There were red marks on her face and neck where someone hit her, and blood on her nose and lips. But my eye was drawn to the handprint on her thigh, where her skirt rode up before the headmistress pulled it down again. Headmistress Davenport and Nurse Spencer pulled her out of the fountain. By then, other teachers gathered, trying to send us back inside, but I remained glued to the spot. My feet were numb. My whole body was numb. Even my mind went numb. I couldn't tear my eyes away. Ada's face burned into my retinas and the handprint on her thigh. Somehow, I got back to my room. I don't remember how. I had a vague recollection of a teacher leading me upstairs, and then I was on my bed, shivering, the curtains drawn against the scene outside. I looked down at my feet. They were bluish-purple with cold. Horrified, I stuffed them under the blanket, chafing them with my equally cold hands until the color returned. Blinking, I stared around our room. Nothing had changed since I went to the infirmary the night before, but everything felt foreign. There was still a table in the middle of the room, under the window, which Ada and I shared and used as a nightstand. My glasses and flu mask rested on top of my copy of the yellow wallpaper. Ada had marked her place in Cosmopolitan with a hairpin. There was a pile of them next to the lamp. We'd been reading passages to each other before bed. Me, lines about a wo woman driven insane as she peeled back the wallpaper in her attic room, and Ada from the Edgar Wallace thriller advertised on the cover of the magazine. The table was framed by our beds, both rumpled. The shiny black boots Ada always wore with her uniform were underneath. One lay haphazardly on its side next to her slippers. Her dressing gown hung over the foot of the bed. Our beds faced the door. On either side was a desk for us to do our homework, and, in, and on the remaining walls we each had a wardrobe and a small bookshelf. Each half of the room was a mirror image of the other, but they were vastly different. Ada hung pictures of actors from moving pictures on her side, along with portraits of her family. There was a glamour shot of her mother that could have come out of Life magazine. She was so beautiful. My side of the room was nearly bare. I had my books, of course, all arranged alphabetically by author, but the only thing on my wall was a piece of framed embroidery I'd done last term, of a cardinal and a sparrow perched on a flowering branch. Ada used to tease me that it was a portrait of us, bosom friends with her in her red hair and me with my plain brown. I stared at it as if I'd never seen it before. The red of the cardinal was the brightest thing on my side of the room. I stared at it, lost in the overlap of the stitches, tracing each one with my eyes. 
There was an area where the thread was too tight and the warp of the linen out of square. I frowned, trying to decide if it bothered me enough to take the whole thing apart. I hate it when things that should be perfectly square don't line up at 90 degrees. Crawling to the head of the bed, I pulled aside the curtain and peered out. Someone had brought the headmistress her coat and gauze mask, or she'd gone inside to get them. She was talking to two policemen. Nurse Spencer knelt by Ada's head. Someone had covered her with a blanket, but in my head I still saw her damaged face. Saw the bruising on her temple, her split lip. I saw the frost on her eyelashes and hair and the blue-white hue of her skin. You could have prevented this. It's all your fault, I thought, letting the curtain drop back. My feet weren't blue anymore, but the rest of me still felt numb as I climbed out of bed and retrieved a clean uniform from my wardrobe. Ankle-length navy blue skirt, navy blouse. I thought the sailor collar looked childish, but no one asked my opinion about anything. They also hadn't asked my opinion about making the entire uniform out of wool. I had a red marker on the base of my neck where I couldn't stop scratching. Under the uniform, I wore a silk slip to make it less itchy. I braided my hair into two tails. I tried pinning them up the way Ada used to do for me, but the ends always stuck out and I could tell the right side was crooked and would fall down the first time I took the stairs too quickly. I took out the pins and left it, allowing the braids to fall down my back. Even in thick wool socks and my sturdy brown boots, my toes still felt cold. I pulled my fingers into the sleeve of my blouse, curling them into fists. Why was I so cold? I must have been inside for over an hour. Our usually sweltering room, it was above the kitchen, felt like an ice box. Before I left my room, I put on my glasses and my mask. There hadn't been any cases of influenza at the Mount Sinai School for Young Ladies, yet, but if the police were here, that meant outsiders. Every girl knew someone who had died from the pandemic. I'd lost two cousins and an aunt already. When my uncle found out he didn't have a family to come home to, he climbed out of the trench and walked into the German line. The army sent back a casket, but I overheard grandfather say there wasn't enough left to call it a real funeral. He had to be identified by his watch. The clock in the dormitory parlor said it was half past eight. Everyone should have been leaving breakfast and on their way to their first class. The girls huddled around the couches, talking in small groups. Some were still in their night dresses. Julia! A dozen heads all turned to look at me as I entered the parlor. I stopped in my tracks. The girls flocked to me, all clamoring for answers. Oh, Julia, I'm so sorry. You were her friend, weren't you? You shared a room. Where did she go? What happened? You poor thing, you must be devastated. Someone put a hand on my shoulder. I took an automatic step back, pulling out of their circle. The babble cut off abruptly. Why were they so interested in me? I'd started at Mount Sinai the year before and had never been the subject of so much interest, not even on my first day. Give her some air, snapped Bernice. She was still in her nightdress, the pink ribbons around her collar incongruous with her stocky, athletic figure and alto voice. The other girls listened, backing away. Bernice was pleasant enough, for all that she usually sounded like she was angry at everyone. She wasn't afraid to pick a girl up by her collar, though, and teach her a lesson if it came to it. She did it once when Elvira Compton made fun of Sarah Brown's new glasses. After that, everyone left Sarah alone, and no one crossed Bernice. "'Are you all right?' asked Mary Ann. The prefect for our year, she always tried to mother us. She reached out to put a hand on my shoulder, and I took another step back. I stared at them, still standing too close. I didn't know what to say, so I started with the obvious. The police are here. Well, of course. Did you think the headmistress wouldn't call them? Elvira might have learned not to pick on anyone directly, but it didn't stop her from treating the rest of us like we were below her. Have they talked to anyone yet? I asked. No, not yet. Miss Comstock sent everyone back to the dorms to wait. Miss Comstock was the teacher in charge of our year. Miss Grace. We all turned to see Miss Comstock standing in the hall. She gestured to me. Come here, Julia. The police would like a word. I followed her down to the first floor. Enid, one of the kitchen maids, was hunched over the bench in the entry hall, sobbing. Nurse Spencer tried to soothe her, rubbing her back. She was wrapped in an afghan I recognized from the formal parlor where we met visitors. 
Now, there's nothing to be afraid of, but as your Ada's roommate, they want to talk to you. I nodded dumbly. Everything was out of order. I hadn't seen so many faces without masks in weeks. At first, it looked like Ohio would be spared from the brunt of the Sp Spanish influenza outbreak, but in the past few days, it had reached epidemic proportions, even in our small community. Dozens of girls had already gone home, but many of us had nowhere to go. With the city of Chillicothe quarantined, I couldn't go back home, and sending half the girls away would mean sending them into homes with active flu cases. So far, Mount Sinai, the church and the boys' and girls' schools attached to it, had been spared, but we all wondered how long that would last. The area schools had been closed for a week, but we could stay open so long as no one left. Most of us had nowhere else to go. There was a sign posted in the dining room with all of the rules. No visitors, no leaving campus. All deliveries had to be made to the back door, and windows had to be open at least half an inch. Masks had to be worn to class, and our in-town days, the one day a month we could go to Chillicothe to shop or visit friends or family, were canceled until f further notice. Mount Sinai Church started having services for students an hour early so we wouldn't interact with the public. The policeman sat at the headmistress's desk, scribbling in a notebook. A mask covered half his face. It was hard to read his expression over the gauze. He looked up when we came in. You're Julia Grace? Yes, sir. You were Ada Brooks's roommate? Yes, sir. Do you know what she was doing last night? No, sir. I was in the infirmary last night. I get headaches sometimes, I explained. Headaches? I swallowed hard, fidgeting with my locket. I'd worn the back smooth over the years by rubbing it with my thumb. Yes, sir. I had a headache most of yesterday, but it started to get worse just before bed. I couldn't sleep, so I went to the infirmary to ask Nurse Spencer for some aspirin. She told me I should stay in the infirmary for the night, since it's usually quieter and a little darker. When was the last time you saw Miss Brooks? Around lights out at ten o'clock. I pulled on the pendant until the chain cut into the back of my neck. I let it fall slack again, then repeated the process. He scratched something into his notebook. Did she say anything about going out? About meeting someone? I bit my lip and squeezed the locket harder. Not particularly, no. What do you mean? Ada... Ada had a boyfriend from the academy. Mount Sinai Academy was the all-boys school on the other side of the woods. In between was the church. We saw the boys every Sunday, but otherwise we weren't to interact with them, except on special occasions, like the Christmas dance. Do you know his name? I shook my head. She didn't say. They'd only been seeing each other for a week or two. She said she wanted to see where it would go before she introduced us. His eyebrow went up. You didn't ask for more information? I thought girls were gossips who told each other everything. I glared at him. Of course I asked, but she didn't want to tell me, and it was none of my affair. You didn't ask after her? You didn't try to find her letters or read her diary? Why would I? It wasn't my business. I thought she would tell me in her own time, if she wanted to. But surely she would tell you something about him. I eyed him, unsure if he was just doing his job or if he really thought I was hiding something. When I didn't answer right away, he tried again. You were, I imagine, fairly close. Ada was my closest friend. My only friend. The chain cut into the back of my neck again. I twisted it tighter on my index finger. And friends tell each other secrets, don't they? Isn't that what young girls do? I dropped the necklace and let my hands fall into my lap. This was just too much. Do you have any daughters, officer? He blinked at me, caught off guard. No. Then let me assure you that while friends do confide in each other, every girl also has her secrets, something she doesn't want to share even with her closest friend. The policeman sighed. Very well, if there's nothing else you can add, you may leave. For a moment, I thought about telling him. The man was so off-putting, so I held my tongue and laughed. One by one, all the girls in the 11th grade were called down to talk to the police, but most of their interviews didn't last more than a few minutes. Rather than be cornered by the girls in the common room, 
I went straight back to my room and shut the door. I peeled off my mask and threw it on the bed, glad to be rid of it. I made the bottoms of my glasses fog up when I breathed too hard, and the hot air trapped inside the gauze made it hard to breathe. My eye landed on the nightstand, and I thought back to the night before, when we'd been reading to each other. We both loved a good scary story. The house I'd grown up in, my grandmother's house, was haunted. Ada loved to hear stories about that house. I'd promised she could come visit over Christmas vacation if her parents said it was all right. She was thrilled by the idea of staying in the old guest room, which once belonged to my great uncle, who had consumption and went mad after two years of being bedridden. There was also a family legend that a maid hung herself in the attic after great-great-grandfather forced himself on her. Grandmother said it was nonsense, but I had seen her once, through the attic window one evening when we came home late. She said it was just a reflection, but I knew what I saw. I went to the window, looking down on the fountain below. The infirmary was also on the third floor, in the little protruding wing at the back of the building. I could see it from our window. My breath formed a cloud on the glass. What had possessed Ada to go out last night? It was so cold. A boy seemed a very poor reason to go traipsing around the woods in the dark and the cold, but as Ada regularly reminded me, I was hardly an expert on such matters. Michael Weaver had once slipped me a note in chapel, asking me to meet him after the service. We walked the gardens around the chapel, but when he tried to hold my hand, I pulled away. I suppose he was handsome enough, but I simply had no interest. The other girls spoke in dreamy tones of kissing boys and canoodling under the stars or by candlelight. My only experience was last New Year's at my grandmother's party. A boy from down the street, Stephen, kissed me at midnight. He wanted more. I found it wet, sloppy, and terribly awkward. Ada insisted it got better with practice. I didn't have anyone I wanted to practice with. I looked down at her hairpins, the haphazard pile under the lamp. A few strands of red hair still clung to one or two of them. On the other side of the room, Ada's wardrobe stood, the door cracked open slightly. I went around the bed to it, inhaling a whiff of perfume. When I opened the door, I saw the little case where she kept her cosmetics. Strictly contraband, of course. Mount Sinai girls were demure and reserved. We weren't supposed to paint our faces or wear perfume. Usually, the case crouched in the back of the wardrobe, hidden behind the hems of skirts and dresses. On the top tray was the little teardrop-shaped glass vial of perfume. Isn't it fine? Mother will never notice it's gone. She has dozens just like it. She used to get them from France before the war, Ada said, holding the delicate bottle under my nose. If nothing else, the perfume confirmed she was meeting a boy. She'd have been sent straight to the headmistress's office if she wore, per- if she wore perfume to class. We weren't even supposed to use scented soap, though some girls did anyway. I put the bottle back in the case and pushed it to the back of her wardrobe, where the smell of cedar would eventually overpower the fragrance of roses. Stepping back from the wardrobe to close the doors, my heel caught on a loose floorboard and I stumbled. I landed with a thump on my backside, my head bouncing off Ada's mattress. With stars dancing in front of my eyes, I didn't hear the knock until Miss Comstock pushed open the door with her hip and it banged off my desk. "'Julia, what on earth are you doing down there?' she asked, dropping an empty crate onto Ada's bed. "'Nothing. I tripped, that's all,' I said, scrambling to my feet and brushing down my skirt." Are you all right? I'm fine, Miss Comstock. Good. I brought this. The headmistress contacted Ada's parents. They are unable to come collect her things. Concerns over the epidemic, you know. The headmistress has asked, that is, if you're feeling up to it, if you would pack Ada's things. I can help you if you need it. I thought of the perfume, the makeup. No, no, that's all right. I can do it. The teacher raised an eyebrow. Had I answered too quickly? I shifted my weight, my heel rocking back and forth on the loose floorboard until it slid back into place with a snap. Miss Comstock cocked her head. Are you sure you're well, Julia? Do you need to see the nurse for a headache powder? I took a deep breath, counting as I exhaled, trying to regulate my breathing, my tone, my words, my cadence. I'm fine, really. Pacing each syllable to match the ticking of the clock on the nightstand, I waited, hands clasped behind my back. Well, if you're certain. I nodded, holding my breath until she left. 
As soon as the door closed, I knelt down, prying the floorboard back up. I thought for that brief moment I was sprawled on the floor that there'd been something underneath. There, the floorboard came loose in my hand, and under it I found a stack of letters tied with a blue velvet ribbon. I recognized it. Ada wore it two or three weeks ago to church and said it was from an admirer. I suddenly wished I'd paid more attention to her wistful anecdotes of stolen kisses in the churchyard, where the overgrown trees and bushes and the plethora of stone monuments provided ample hiding places away from the eyes of teachers and Pastor Brown. Pulling on the ribbon, I unfolded the first letter. So that is it for chapter one of By the Grace. You can find links to that and all of my books down below. Uh, please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this reading and this podcast episode. And do check out the Patreon and the Gumroad Shop as well. Thank you so much for spending time with me tonight. I hope you have something cute and fluffy to cuddle with and that you are staying healthy and safe out there. <laughs>